And we are recording. All right, so we're here with John Smoltz, former pitcher of the Atlanta Braves and a couple of other teams, but mostly the Atlanta Braves. Uh, can you tell us how did you get started uh, as a baseball player? Because if I, re if I read correctly, you also played football when you were young, right? Yeah, so sports came a little bit later uh, at the age of seven. I was, uh, I was involved in a musical family, so I played the accordion when I was four years old till seven. Uh, my parents were both accordion teachers, so that's kind of where my uh, discipline, work ethic, and, and just practice started. I had to do a lot of practicing at an early age and a lot of discipline, so, but at the age of seven, I, I asked my parents, you know, I said, hey, listen, I want to be a Major League Baseball player. It kind of came out of nowhere for them. They didn't know much about okay. sports. So I had watched it on TV. I, I don't know. I guess I fell in love with it and, and started my quest of playing baseball. I grew up in Lansing, Michigan, so the seasons really dictated the sports. So when baseball <laughs> was over, I would play uh, basketball, and in basketball, I'd play football. And, um, you know, I really uh, – enjoy getting outdoors and doing whatever sport or season was there. Now the ironic thing in Michigan, I never put on ice skates and never ice skated. So hockey was never <laughs> something that I did, but I'm just self-taught, you know, I'd throw a rubber ball outside a brick wall or I'd shoot baskets, you know, by myself or throw a football up in the air and try to chase it down. So I had a brother and a sister one year apart and, you know, I enjoyed every second that I was able to get outdoors I invented games I created games I got neighborhoods together our buddies together play stickball plays football basketball you name it we did it that is so cool uh, because that's definitely something that people don't do today no they don't I, I, I've often said that you know I've had fundraisers at my house for a school that I helped build and uh, the parents would be in the in the basement, we'd have our meeting and the kids would be outside. I had a baseball field, soccer field. I had a tennis court, a volleyball court, basketball court. So they had the luxury to do whatever they wanted to do and they were left outside. And the parents were really worried about what are they gonna do? I said, well, they'll figure it out. Let them be, exactly. you know? And I think that's getting harder and harder for kids to figure out if something isn't pre ordained for them or given the rules for them, it's hard for them to have create creativity because of the technology and the instant access we have to something at our fingertips. So I said, first of all, when this meeting's over, I've already decided I'm all-time quarterback 10 on 10 in the football field. So we need to get this fundraiser going, meeting over, because I'm going outside to play with the kids. <laughs> well, but that's exactly kind of the point. It's like the lack, too much structure. <laughs> Just go, just go play. Whatever they pick up a ball and do something. Yeah, that has been that has been the biggest shift uh, in in the culture of today. And you know, we have more kids probably staying indoors and either playing video games and not getting outdoors and creating. They're you know, we've lost their creativity. You know, their the ability to make up a game. I I made up so many games that I wish I could have passed on to my kids that they just probably didn't think were cool. Um, but we had a blast growing up. I mean, my parents gave me the rules, and when it was time to come in, I would come in, but I'd, I'd always go up against the buzzer. Uh, and, and again, the seasons dictated for us what sport we were going to play. And, you know, I think that the quest for all these um, parents is wanting the best for their kids to, to, to kind of decide for them what they think their sport should be. And it's kind of misguided. And it's not that their intentions are great. It's that the information they're, be, they're given and the, and the companies that are out there to promote that individual sport and that year-round sport has made it more difficult for parents to just kind of freely make decisions for their kids. For sure. And uh, when you started playing baseball, was pitching open or did you try something else first? Well, I played every position uh, except for catcher. Uh, pitching was something that became more natural for whatever reason. I was the smallest kid on every team that I played in until the junior year in high school, but I had an arm that could throw a baseball, pretty, pretty gifted uh, arm. And so that became more of a development that I was looking to try to perfect, you know, become a better pitcher. But I did play all the other positions. Um, 
you know, the baseball we played it was seasonal in Michigan. You didn't have the luxury, fortunately, to play year round like other some of these other states got a burden. I would call it a burden to play all year round because the weather allows it. More is not necessarily better. It's the quality of which you're playing and really the opportunity for that athlete. Uh, athleticism is not something you can make. It's something you're born with. But the development of that athleticism can go in one or two directions. You can burn it out or you can develop it and have balance. And I think that's the beauty of where I grew up. I had the balance of all those sports and I didn't have any kind of overkill or burnout syndrome that would, that exists today that, that families find out too late that their son or daughter has just given up because there's just too much. And the fun factor has gone away. And the business of a 9, 10, 11 year old has become real to them when it really should be more fun. <laughs> uh... Uh, when you started, did you have, were they common to have all these coaches that kids have today at age eight? No, no, no. My dad was, was one of my coaches at T-ball when I started. And then really when I got to, I moved uh, to Lansing, Michigan, and that's really when my sports took off. We had one coach for every team. That was it. And the coach showed up, provided us the opportunity to practice, gave us some insight, and then tournaments or the league would start. And the same thing for basketball, same thing for football. Um, you know, back then, football was flag football. Uh, they moved tackle football to a much earlier age now. But, you know, you were playing flag football back into seventh grade almost, and that's unheard of today. And so, you know, we learned the, the skills that we needed to learn uh, to accomplish that given sport for that time frame, right? And it crossed over because anybody who loved or – was competitive and and loved to compete you were going to play in as many things as you could which meant different sports it just didn't mean as many tournaments all year round that you could play in so uh, that that part for me my parents weren't as versed in sports so they were giving me the opportunity and fortunately that was the times we live in and there wasn't you know there wasn't a bunch of mom and pop shops that were trying to make the next greatest hitter or the next greatest pitter, pitcher or quarterback. There wasn't individualized workouts. There wasn't training setups to try to make you into, you know, a beast uh, or run as fast as you possibly can at the age of eight when you're still developing. There was a lot of things that naturally happened that allowed the body and the person to develop into the athlete they were going to be rather than manufacture or create and spend a lot of money and resources and time in making you know, the next Michael Jordan or the next whoever superstar in the sport. So that, that basically was something that I had the blessing of being able to do. And I look back and I'm so thankful um, that I was able to really live in those times and not live under the pressure of, of mandated, uh, you know, you must do this or you've got to do this or you've got to play all year round. Yeah, because what can you recommend to parents to do a lot of these parents because i do believe that most parents are not obviously trying to ruin their children uh they are kind of trying to and some of it is catching up with the joneses uh some of it is just a fear of missing out on giving the best to their kids uh what what is, what would be a good step-by-step -step, if you will for kids who want to start playing baseball today Yeah, and it's a great question and a tough question because many parents are, and their intent is to be absolutely the best parent they can to give their child the best chance to live that dream, whatever that dream is, to its fulfillment. Um, here's the problem. The business of sports has gotten so big that that r trumps anything else that a professional will say you need to do. In other words, I could line up a hundred parents today and just talk about baseball and the all around ability of rest, you know, how to become the best baseball player. They look at me like I, if they didn't know my resume, they'd say, you don't know what you're talking about. You have not been around in this time frame. I think parents are stuck in the catch up theory. I call it the Heinz 52 catch up theory because they're all trying to catch up to the next person that's already out there in front of them. You know, little Johnny has spent 17 hours a week just hitting in cages. And then he goes 17 hours with a pitching instructor. And then he goes to it, – it's a, it's a nonstop zapping of the kid's enjoyment of just literally going out. No one plays pickup baseball. No one plays – they don't even know what strikeout is. They don't know how to throw a ball against a wall. So all of these things are done for them. It's kind of guided their journey 
to getting and quest their quest to getting a scholar scholar scholarship and then draft dollars and i think parents intent has allowed them to uh, infiltrate all of these facilities and get the finest ones that they can afford and at the end of the day okay if you strip it back besides the fact that these kids are burning out faster and quitting sports quicker than ever before you will have paid for two scholarships for that young boy or young girl before they get to college and get that scholarship or the draft dollars they would get you've already spent so the fine line is understanding that through somebody else's lens somebody that you can trust identifying what kind of athlete your child is but by the time they get to 11 or 12 you have an opportunity for the sport to choose your child i really believe that i think you, you we try to choose the sport early but then your body develops in a way where the sport chooses you I don't think parents understand that because they could have a, a great desire to say, my son's going to be the next great Tiger Woods. So I'm going to have him hitting balls all day as many times as I can, join a club. That burnout rate just magnified 100 times over. He may not, he may not have or she may not have the hand-eye coordination to do that. Or they may grow to be 6'5", 240. That may not be a good sport for them. So I think the balance of a parent giving their child the opportunity to do something they're passionate about, not pushing them in something that they want to live vicariously through their child. If your child shows a passion and it is generally good, allow them if you can and have the means to pursue that passion and then find out along the way what little things you could do to help fulfill that passion. And I, and, and I don't think people understand what that means because I can show you a gifted athlete that has no desire whatsoever or work ethic, and then I could show you the, the one uh, athlete that may not be as gifted but has all the other attributes. The, he's going to go farther, but at the end of the day, the gifted athlete always has certain advantages because of genetics. And I have yeah. this model that I would love to see a certain amount of states do, which is a pie-in-the-sky model. <laughs> I've been saying for years – Give me the top five athletes in every sport at the age 12 and below. Identify them somehow through some mechanism of coaches. Just give me the five that are best at each sport. And I wish the state could pay the parent the money it takes to not play that sport for two years. And they'll probably sweat like crazy going, oh, my gosh, little Johnny, little Debbie's not going to be able to be with it. And in two years – Without playing those significant sports, they'll still be the best five athletes in two years. That's my belief because athleticism, genetics, you can't, you can't manufacture. And those things are always going to be there. I held a camp for 15, 13 years, a baseball camp. I did it in season. And I was teaching a lot of these principles to these parents and these kids. It was from ages basically 6 to 16. Primarily, it was a lot of 6 to 10-year-olds. And let's say I averaged 250 to 300 kids per year. And I, I literally threw to every one of them and I worked with every one of them. On average, I would go to two to three parents a year and say, your kid has a special arm. Think about that per percentage. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet you that most of the parents that sent their kids there thought that 150 to 200 of them had a special gift or arm. So the development of each child needs to be given time. We have shrunk time. These kids are losing out on the joy of the particular sport that they are learning to play. Basically just summed up my movie uh, <laughs> because that's exactly kind of like what we're talking about. It's like, who are we really doing this for? Because so many things, it seems like we're doing it for the pleasure of the coach to say, well, I trained little Johnny. So now all of a sudden little Johnny is whatever. He can throw 50 pitches against four-year-olds, you know, something ridiculous like that. Um, when would you recommend kids to start, uh, or what, you know, say pitchers, because that uh, was your main thing, your main focus, obviously, as a professional. What do you think kids should do if they wanted to pitch today? Like, what would be a good progress, if you will, high in the sky progress? Yeah, I think this is the hardest challenge for a lot of uh, parents who want to get in the system and they want to get their child in the system of getting the idea of every one of them being a major league pitcher. Kids are throwing too many competitive pitches too early. Not every pitch needs to be competitive. You can pitch and throw and pick up games and practice and learn how to – we're 
first of all, we're pitching way too, too early. The reason we have kids pitch as early as we do because we don't have enough adults who know how to throw strikes without hitting kids <laughs> to teach the fundamentals other than just watch. This is what it looks like when you go to a little league game. It's the catcher, the pitcher, and the hitter, and that's it. Usually that's it. It's about balls, ball one, ball two, strike one, strike two, strike three. And it's become a, a – it's a tougher game to develop our little – uh, Frank, who's sitting in left field picking weeds because the ball never comes out that way. I mean, it's become pitcher dominant, right? And I think that would, if I could universally change one thing, it would be don't let them pitch in games so early. Why do we have to have them pitching at eight years old? It doesn't make sense. It's not a natural motion. The kids that can pitch at eight, old, eight years old probably should, but how many of them are there in the country? There's just not that many. And then the rate and velocity of which they're pitching such at an early age is just giving them an opportunity to increase their chances for surgery later in life. I've had parents come to me, and I thought that they were talking about, okay, they would say something like this. My son is 9-1 uh, and one with a 0 0.75 ERA. And I'm like, you know, is he a freshman in college? Is he a sophomore? He's like, no, he's 8. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Eight years old, that should not be the focus. Why are we, why are we taking that level of, of competitiveness and even statistical information and making that? And I have that a lot, hear that a lot. So I think the biggest problem in the game today has been the technology that has been allowed to be part of our game. And we call it kind of carnival baseball. Everyone's trying to see how hard they can throw it. And by throwing it super hard, a game, and the tendons and the ability for young players, because they all develop at such a different uh, age, we can't put them all in the same, same box. So um, I tell parents all the time, it's like if you had a, a Christmas present that you were going to give your, your child, you're going to wrap it up and put it under the tree. Well, imagine if his arm is, your, is, that, is that present. you got to wrap it up at times. You've got to make sure that it's not being overused and abused so that that present, that gift, is no longer allowed for him to pitch in high school or college or beyond. And my number one goal for every kid at, that went through my camp is play this game as long as you possibly can. Why wouldn't you want to give yourself the chance to play in high school and then maybe in college and then for some of the most elite, maybe in the big leagues? But given the fact that we have fast-tracked them so much, I think parents' intent is pure. I really do. There's a percentage of maybe 10% of parents – who were frustrated with their own maybe little you know career that they had that they were going to shape the way better for their for their child and all they're actually doing is they're giving their child an, a quicker chance to be burned out from the sport that they you should be able to defend yourself if you're allowing your son to play a game in other words if they're afraid of the ball baseball may not be the sport early on let them develop if they can't throw you know um 10 feet it may not be their sport so there's always ways to find out the child will tell you what he is or she is per passionate about or not and I think the hardest part is literally listening to that and knowing that you know so much more as a parent that you're going to help develop you know help develop that child now I I don't coach baseball I love watching it but I, I wouldn't know where to begin to coach anybody um, I coach soccer um, one of the big problems I see with the soccer world and youth is that we coach to win a game. We don't really coach the kids or teach the kids what the game looks like and what are you actually supposed to do. You know, if this happens, you do this kind of situation. You, know, you actually teach them about the game. Does that happen in baseball where we don't teach kids anymore how, not just how to pitch, physically, like you know, this is how you throw a fastball, this is how you throw a curveball. Uh, but do we actually teach kids what it means to pitch or to hit in certain counts or to positioning yourself on the field properly, those type of things? Not really, because really, if I'm a youth coach today and I've got three really good arms, that's all I care about because that's where you're going to dominate. You don't have to teach infielding, outfielding, and even the finite uh, fundamentals of the game as long as you have a pitcher and a catcher you're going to dominate that baseball game. And that's really what it comes down to is uh, winning tournaments in a weekend, playing seven games in a weekend, not for every coach, but what I have always encouraged coaches to do is have some non-negotiable that you're willing to explain to your parents. 
that if it costs you some games, you're not costing the careers of these young men that are hopefully going to become young men. Teach the fundamentals of throwing certain pitches and not throwing certain pitches at a young age. Teach your infielders on what to do in the fundamentals because what's become a game of tremendous athleticism and raw talent, it's become a one-way game. It's become the individual talent of that person becomes more important than the sum of the means. And that is a very difficult task when you have the coach with the right perspective, teaching the right fundamentals and just the gamemanship they may not win, and then what's the parents' pressure going to be on that coach if he hasn't started uh, uh, winning games or tournaments? So you are 100% right. It filters first from the parents because the parents get so involved. I watched maybe 2,000 soccer games with all three of my girls playing soccer their entire life. One played all the way through college, and I had to stay away from the parents. I had to get away <laughs> from the, the – I mean, it was so much venom and so much – you know, the, 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 the referee had no chance, and the kids were trying to move on and play in all these tournaments. You play everywhere. And the game ends up becoming your life. And the one thing that I didn't like about soccer is how rough, obviously, it was getting for girls, but just the animosity that was happening on the sidelines. I, my, parents, my kids used to say, Dad, you never say a word ever and whenever we're watching sports. And I say, because I'm watching you play the sport. We'll have a discussion afterwards, but if you're listening to me yell at you, this is that's wrong. And if you're listening to me yell at an official, another player, that's wrong on me. So I used to just sit back and watch the game. I'll never forget, I never said an entire word my entire life watching games except for one time I couldn't help myself with 20 <laughs> seconds left in the soccer match. And this little girl was so disrespectful to the official I don't know why he didn't give her a red card. I guess the game was about to end. And the only thing I said to her that probably, I mean, we're talking about a 17-year-old girl, is why can't you just shut up and play the game? And she oh, looked boy. at me like I had just two heads. I mean, it was so – what was coming out of her mouth was just unbelievable. And it was the only time I said, respect the game. And, and she didn't say anything to me to her credit. The game finished, you know, she went on. and. But that's the kind of thing that, you know, we get lost in in this, in this youth sports. And if you have the ability to travel with your family and do all these tournaments, God bless you, that's great. But then, you know, think about all your other, the other siblings that are, are kind of growing up in this world and think that that's the way it's supposed to be. So it is a tremendous challenge for parents. Um, and the ones that have the best balance, I really think, are the ones that have the best peace, that they're not going to have the stress that has been poured on them as their young uh, children develop into potentially a high school player or a college player. Um, but less than 1% of them obviously are going to be a professional player. It shouldn't, it shouldn't dampen the goal or the quest to become a professional player if that's their desire. But I think parents have to learn to get out of the way and use some of that radar and trust that they have into making tough decisions to say, we aren't going to do this as a family or we're not going to cross the line here. That is very difficult for parents to make that mandate before it gets too far. Once it gets too far, it's over. You, know, you become a hostage of that sport and that, that entity that has got, you know, basically you by the reins. Yeah, because one of the things that kind of drives me a little crazy is that no one starts playing whatever the sport and he's in the Hall of Fame. Wayne Gretzky didn't. You didn't. Uh, a lot of your teammates didn't or whoever you play with didn't. You started somewhere. You didn't start pick up a ball, oh, I won 300 games. Um, so how is it that we parents today have, have this weird thing that, well, my son is great at soccer today. Uh, tomorrow he may be the greatest. He may be seven foot tall and he's going to be a center, right? Like you said, the sport chooses you. Right. Um, how do we try to bridge that gap of showing parents that this is a process, this is a journey? Nobody wins 300 games at eight years old. Yeah, and it's a challenge because it was a challenge for me. I had four children grow up through my house, and I played professional sports, and I knew everything there was to know about baseball and sports and competitiveness because I lived it. I mean, I was living it. And still, I was not the final voice in our house with my, our kids. They were listening to other people. That's the natural tendency of a child that they, the information they're being given from experts maybe that have 
in their own house don't really set in until later in life because they're going to listen to somebody else. But I think, again, the challenge is, is watching that child. Do they, would they, and do anything it takes to play that sport? That's passion. That's love. Like, are they outside by themselves kicking a soccer ball or are they throwing, you know, shooting baskets? Like, there are some definable signs that would tell me that that child loves the game no matter what and where he can play it or she can play it. Then there's the family that pushes that child and pushes them and gets them out the door and, and, and is making him because of what they think they see in him. That imbalance will cause basically kind of that Heisman approach, a stiff arm of not really enjoying the sport as much. So that's the challenge for finding out in your own family, what are the rules? What can you pursue uh, relentlessly? Or what are the rules to find the rules? And then have an understanding of what is the bonus that can take place if, if certain things come about. Because from each travel, baseball, soccer, football, well, the tra thankfully football doesn't have travel, basketball, all these different specialized sports are going to come more and more and more opportunities. And if you don't have a baseline for what you're thinking about, those opportunities are going to stretch you even farther. And then my biggest thing is kids aren't resting enough. Um, they're working out too much. They're sports specific way too much. There's an, imba an imbalance in their body that will show up later in life because they don't have any cross training to allow the body to, to recover from a one-sided sport in baseball or golf uh, to the balance of basketball and the athleticism to soccer, you know, football. and they didn't quite see those sports is so that their their freedom to make those choices and stand by them with with the best of their abilities uh, would truly help their their children if you can take them to a camp great if they can get some instruction great but again, no one had to tell me to go outside when I was little. My parents said, it's time to come inside. That's, the, <laughs> that's what they would tell me. I loved it so much. And I grew up in a different atmosphere. I was a musician. I was somebody that my parents' expertise, even in their expertise, they let somebody else teach me the accordion. They didn't do it. I think there's value in that. Um, but at the same time, if you can, they would give me their insights, which was invaluable. Uh, but I really believe that, that we've, we've got the train off the tracks. It's going to be hard to get the train back on the tracks unless people can continuously see what's happening through these studies, what's happening through these kids that are crying out that no one's really listening. Um, because the studies that I've been involved in was more, they're more between the, before the age of 13, more than ever kids playing sports more than ever mm -hmm. this was a few years ago and more than ever are burned out before the age of 13 think about that mm -hmm. and two of the three reasons are coaches and parents yep and those two reasons are really two in the same because that's where the burnout starts happening between uh the expectations of the parents and the demand of so many things that are going on for that one particular child and the demand of his time taking up that one sport I'm fearful that in some point in the near future, we're not going to have certain high school sports. I'm fearful sure. that those certain high school sports are going to go away because of the specialized uh, mm -hmm. club sports that are taking over and basically giving the parents a blueprint to scholarship dollars or, again, draft dollars. So that's my – I used to love putting on a high school uniform and representing the high school I went to and playing that sport knowing that I had an obligation to play as hard as I can for that high school team. No, of, of course I wanted to be a major league baseball player, but that was just one step to becoming that. And I, I'm wondering how much longer that's going to be, you know, in our country. Well, I don't know for baseball, but soccer, high school soccer is, I would dare say, almost dead the way they are structuring it these days in a lot of states. In a lot of states, I see too much of clubs taking over and not allowing that fun. Because I think that you also have a different kind of fun when you play in high school versus a regular club team. You know, you're playing with your friends, right. you're playing with, it's a completely different 
environment uh, that I think it's missing or it's becoming missing uh, these days. Um, now, one thing that I find a lot with soccer is the kids don't watch it. Do you find that with baseball players or kids coming through? Do they actually watch the game or do they just say, I want to be the next X, Y, Z? No, I think with baseball, people are watching, which is the reason why you're getting certain uh, styles being rewarded, you know, uh, in the game today, meaning throwing it as hard as you can, hit it as far as you can. The fundamentals are suffering, but the reward system at the big league level and the professional level is always going to dictate and trickle down into the youth level. And they say it's actually backwards. The youth has kind of trickled down into the big leagues because of the way the young pitchers are being trained. I think that um, overall, maybe not like the generations in the past that watched it, that's all we had. There's so many options now, and there's so many things that kind of take our attention away from that sport that, that it does make it difficult for a lot of kids to watch that particular sport to learn. Uh, they have technology in the hand of the phone is in their hand all the time. So they're directly connected and it's an indirectly um, adverse situation to become a great player in whatever sport. If you're not careful, you'll be distracted in ways that will take away from your time of greatness. And, you know, the documentaries of, of Michael Jordan were just, were just um, aired and you see the greatness and he's the, the, the highest peak in the pinnacle. Like he, no one, there's not going to be many like Michael Jordan, but no. the thing is, is the focus and, det and attention to detail was at the greatest level. That's what made him so great. Sure, he had an immeasurable amount of talent, but there are so many gifted kids in this country that don't understand how to climb that ladder of success. I mean, they want to be Michael Jordan, but they don't know the gap in between that goes into it. And I think that's the missing piece because we have so much much that takes our attention away from um, divulging into that sport and learning to become a better player. That's the challenge that we have today from versus 20, 30 years ago. Now, because everything is about wins and losses these days, and it's not about how you actually learn, how do you work uh, on the mental strength of kids when they don't have a 14 or 9 or whatever record you told me earlier about that parent that told you, you know, when you don't go 14 and 0 and an ERA of 0 0.2 or whatever, ridiculous. What happens when all of a sudden you have a 3 and 14 record and all of a sudden people are starting to hit you? And we don't seem to, you know, all of a sudden coaches, I find, say, okay, you suck now. Bye bye. Instead of, hey, you know, this is a process. You know, nobody's going to win every single game. Yeah, that's also a very big challenge that a lot of professionals deal with. The first time they ever fail might be at the professional level, which is a hard place to learn that. Um, you know, perseverance and overcoming life lessons. I always say to parents, I said, let your kids fail, man. That is the best way for them to grow and succeed and, and find one, one or two ways. They're going to run from the problem or run to the problem. There's nothing wrong with failing and learning and uh, the, the child that doesn't want to fail or it suffocates them to not want to play the sport anymore well then maybe that was probably going to happen one way or another but I think the biggest thing I learned and the challenges my dad gave me he never pushed me he just encouraged me and he said get up and do it again you know learn from your mistakes that is the beauty of sports there's a lot of tough things that come with sports I'd say the number one thing the toughest thing that comes with sports is injuries take you out some things you just can't control. Like injuries are part of sports. It's very heartbreaking and tough to watch a young, gifted person maybe cut short of their career based on an injury. But then the other tough thing is to watch your child fail or to watch hard lessons and to watch the moment of, of success and failure be a coin flip and, you know, not know the difference between the two. And I think that is what I, was, I learned that when you said early on about you didn't just win 300 games – you became a Hall of Famer later. It's because of that that I became a Hall of Famer. It's not just my talent, because there was many more people talented than I am that just couldn't adjust or learn from their life lessons and even the lessons in sports. Um, one last question. One of the things that I, and you just touched it a lot, is kids today are not balanced. They don't really know, well, they're not allowed to just find out who they are. Uh, not just or they're labeled too early as a, you're going to be the next 
John Smoltz. You're going to be the next Mike Trout. You're going to be the next Wayne Gretzky or Sidney Crosby or whomever. Joe Montana, Tom Brady. Uh, how do we help kids today uh, balance themselves? Like you said, you like to play music. Uh, and I'm guessing maybe you're still playing or maybe you play a different instrument today. Uh, but so many kids, once they stop playing, because at some point, everybody stops playing, whether it's you or anyone else, you will stop. Uh, nobody plays until they're 100 years old, uh, professionally, I mean. So what can we do to make the kids realize you're not just a baseball player, you're not just a football player, you are a person first. And how do yeah, we integrate that? I think that's the biggest challenge and probably um, the hardest challenge for coaches. And coaches are given their, their teams and given the responsibility, hopefully, with the, uh, the knowledge to impact those players in, in various ways. It's not just to make them necessarily better at their sport. It's to make them better in life from some of these things that they're going to experience and they'll utilize. Not everybody loves sports. But sports has impacted about just about everybody in some way. There's life lessons to learn in every single sport that you play, both good and bad, that could stunt your growth or continue to make you into the best CEO or best teacher or best doctor. It's not just about professional athletes all being churned out of this kind of, you know, entity of, of youth sports. It's about learning a lot of life skills that a lot of people who don't understand sports or maybe don't like sports are missing out on some things that you can learn later in life. And I think that's the challenge of the coach, to, to create a game plan, to give the kids an opportunity to play a great sport, but to learn something from the beginning of the season to the end that they can grow from, teach them, or, or steer them away from their line of thinking. Because you're going to have individual kids that only care about themselves and what their parents have told them. But the, but the goal is to stretch them a little bit. The goal is to get them outside of themselves and to see things differently. It's not easy. It's not fun. And that's the challenge. That's what I miss most about coaching. I love coaching. I just don't have the time to do it anymore. And I go all the way back to my high school years when I was I, I, first or second year in the big leagues, I was coaching basketball and got a chance to have an impact with some you know, freshman basketball players that I'll never forget. I learned a lot about myself. That's the challenge. And for parents, the challenge is also sometimes sitting on your hands, sometimes giving that encouragement, sometimes that kick in the butt. That balance is important. You can't always be kick in the butt, kick in the butt, kick in the butt. You've got to be an encourager. You've got to be, you know, a teacher at times. And even if you don't know that sport, understand that your child is going to go through some ebbs and flows of motions uh, that sports just absolutely weans out, you know, certain kids. And uh, maybe it isn't for everybody, but it's a great challenge. And I think what you're trying to do is bring light to a situation that has needed light for a long time. <laughs> well, thank you. And hopefully we can definitely make this happen.